be on the exam. I'll do this now. And the other little bit of announcement I'd like to make is that we're going to change the order in which we do things a little bit. According to the syllabus I handed out the first day, uh, the next section we were going to do was chapter 7, which has to do with <clears throat> biological effects of radiation. And I'm going to put that off a little bit. We will cover it. But I want to make sure we get to the stuff on fission and fusion, which is really why most of you, I think, are in this class at all. Uh, so we'll do that next week. So chapter 10 will be the next chapter we uh, cover. If you want to start looking ahead, you know, after the exam on Friday, that's fine. And on Friday, I will have a homework set for you for the following week that will cover chapter 10. Okay? So again, same kind of deal on the exam this week. And the other point to remember is Wednesday is a holiday, okay? So we're not going to be here. I'm not going to be here Wednesday. So uh, don't come around office hours looking for me. I'm not going to be here. It's a university holiday. So I expect there'll be a lot of people coming to office hours today, and that's fine. And if we have a lot coming, we'll find a room bigger than my office to accommodate everybody. And the TAs are available for office hours on the other days during the week. Any other questions about that? OK. So what I want to talk to you today about is an application that some of us here in the department have been working on for a while. And it has to do with looking for the materials that are necessary to make nuclear weapons in cargo containers. Okay? Um, we haven't really talked about nuclear fission very much yet. But let me just tell you that the thing it takes to make a nuclear weapon is fissionable material. And in particular, it's really two isotopes that are important. It's uranium-235, which is the isotope we currently use in our nuclear power plants uh, to produce fission, uh, or plutonium-239, another fissionable isotope. And those are the most difficult to obtain ingredients to make a nuclear weapon. And one worry that people have is that someone will attempt to smuggle either a fully constructed nuclear weapon or this fissionable material into our country and detonate it here. And one potential avenue for bringing that material in are these cargo containers. If you go down to the Port of Oakland every single day, you'll see ships like this. This is a photograph that was taken down at the Port of Oakland. A uh, typical ship like that will have several thousand containers on it. Uh, there are many containers under the water line here, so it isn't just what you see here. There's at least as many containers below the water line as there are above. Each of those containers is either 20 or 40 feet long. They can contain just about anything you can imagine. And there are an awful lot of these that come in the United States every year. And so they offer the potential for someone to smuggle this material in the United States, hidden among all the other stuff. And the aim of this project is to try to figure out a way to basically look inside every single container and decide in a very short period of time whether there's something that shouldn't be there or not, and in particular whether it's uranium-235 or plutonium-239. Okay? And the thing we're trying to prevent is that. Okay? We don't want that to happen here or anywhere else. Okay? That's an above-ground nuclear explosion. Okay, so let's spend a little time talking about uh, the ports. Um, Something like 90% of all the trade in the world moves in those cargo containers, okay? There's an enormous volume of them. Something, and this slide's a little bit old, but something like 6 million of these containers come into the United States every single year. And although people think the Port of Oakland is a very big port, it's actually a fairly small one on the scale of the whole country. Uh, the one in Long Beach is the biggest in the United States. But in, on the west coast of the United States, we're processing about 11,000 of these cargo containers uh, per day, and obviously if a single nuclear weapon came in and were exploded, the damages would be astronomical, okay? And so that's what we're trying to prevent. The real problem is the cargo. If you were an empty cargo container, I think based on what you've uh, learned so far in this class, it would be relatively easy to spot something that shouldn't be there. Um, the problem is the fact that these containers are actually filled with stuff. And this is a pie chart that we put together from manifests of something like 50,000 containers that came in a few years ago. And you can see that there's all kinds of stuff in it. Uh, they're color-coded according to what it is. So the green wedge up there, which represents almost 30% of the cargo, is food and tree products. There's machinery, there are vehicles, uh, there are metals, there are ores, there's food, there's all kinds of stuff, okay? And Typically, there is what's called a manifest. It's a piece of paper that the shipper fills out stating uh, what he says is in the container. And it may or may not actually reflect what's in the container. 
and very often it's a very sketchy uh, picture of what it is, not details. And so you don't really know exactly what's in the containers. And as I said, the containers are very large, 20 or 40 feet long, half feet wide, eight and a half feet high. Um, the packing is not necessarily homogeneous. There might be one kind of material over here and something else over there. And because the volume of these containers coming and going is so enormous, uh, they come off the ships at a rate of about one per minute. And they get put onto either rail cars or trucks to be taken to wherever the, the cargo ultimately has to be delivered. Uh, what the people at the ports will tell you is if you want to do this and not totally screw up trade all around the world, you have approximately one minute to make your inspection and decide whether there's something bad in there or not. Okay, and so that's actually the goal of this project. And I don't mean to suggest this is the only project of its kind. There are lots of people working on this problem because it is considered to be so important. But that's the goal, is to try to basically look in here in one minute and decide whether uh, that cargo needs to be stopped or whether it can go on or not. Um, let me just make sure I make clear what it is we're looking for. So we're going to look for only one type of threat. Okay, so we're not looking for chemical weapons or biological weapons or conventional explosives or even the materials that are needed to make what's called a dirty bomb. A dirty bomb is a radioactive source that you blow up and just disperse the radioactivity around. Okay? So for example, if you had a very large source of cobalt-60, it's a nice isotope and it's nice gamma rays. Uh, if you had an enormous amount of it, in let's say a powder form and you blew it up with a conventional explosive, you might distribute it over a fair part of the city of Berkeley. And most likely you would kill very few if any people, but you would scare the living daylights out of everybody. And it would probably cause a mass evacuation of the entire city. It would take years and years to clean it up. It would do a tremendous amount of damage, but it wouldn't kill very many people, if any. This on the other hand will kill thousands or millions of people. Okay, that's what we're trying to stop. And so what we're looking for are the ingredients needed to make a nuclear bomb, U-235 or plutonium-239. And we're assuming that our adversaries, the people who would want to do this to us, are not stupid. And so they know as much nuclear physics as we do. And so they're going to shield this stuff as best they can to try to hide it from us. So that's the, the challenge. And what we want to try to do, as I said, is to look inside these cargo containers. And it turns out... You can't just fill one of these cargo containers with arbitrary large amounts of anything you want. So for example, if you're thinking, well, I know how to shield a, a nuclear weapon, I'm just gonna fill this container with lead and put the bomb in the middle of that. Well, it turns out you can't do that. Uh, the cargo containers aren't designed to hold that much weight. Um, it turns out that the most you can have is an average density of about 0.7 grams per cubic centimeter, and that works out to something like 10,000 kilograms of total material in a container that's 20 feet long. So that's the upper limit to what you can put in there, or the cranes won't be able to lift them, the containers will break, and you'll know there's something strange going on. So if you think about looking into the container, you're looking through, and depending on where along your line of sight the object of interest is, you could be looking through zero grams per square centimeter or up to about 150 if it's actually in the center of the container. And you want to make sure that if you develop a scanning system that it's reliable. And it has to be reliable both for finding things that really are there and also not finding things when they're not there. So you have to have a very low rate of what's called false positives, that is thinking there's something bad there when there isn't, or false negatives, missing something which is actually bad. And you've got to do it all in about a minute. Okay, so that's the goal. And we need some useful signature that tells us this stuff is actually there. And so, although we haven't studied fission in detail, you've studied alpha, beta, gamma decay enough uh, that you know how to look up, if you don't already know, how uranium-235 plutonium-239 decay. And the first thought, which everyone comes up with, is, oh, I'm just going to measure the spontaneous radiation given off by these radioactive isotopes. Um, plutonium-239 lives about 24,000 years, and uh, it's an alpha emitter. And you all know that it doesn't take much of anything to stop an alpha particle. And so the alpha particles never get out of the source. They'll never get out of the container. So that's hopeless to try to look for the alpha particles. And the same thing is true for U-235. Um, its half-life is 700 million years and again is an alpha emitter. Both of these nuclei occasionally decay to excited states in the daughter nuclei, which give off gamma rays. 
and you might think we can look for the gamma rays. The trouble is the gamma rays in both cases are low in energy and not very intense, meaning not very often in the decay of either uranium or plutonium do you get a gamma ray. And so very little shielding is required to mask the gamma rays from both of these isotopes. And so fairly quickly everybody has come to the same realization that by what is called passive detection, meaning you bring a Geiger counter or a plastic scintillator or some iodide or whatever near a container, unless the terrorists are really stupid and just happen to put the source on the wall of the container, you're not going to see it. So what almost all the techniques I'm going to talk about rely on is something called active interrogation. And what that means is you're going to shoot something into the container and look for a signal coming back at you which is a unique signature of this fissionable material being there. And that's what I'm going to spend most of the time talking about. Now, when I'm all done, you'll, you know enough now to start thinking, well, gee, I can figure out a way around what he just told me. And that's exactly right. We all know that's true. There's no one solution which is the magic bullet and prevent this from happening. And so, although I'm going to talk mainly about this active interrogation, we don't imagine we would ever rely on it alone. So we're going to hope that the terrorists really are stupid. We are going to have passive detection. I'll show you that. Uh, you might trip them up somehow with that. Um, we're also not going to rely on just the technique I'm telling you. We're going to do x-rays. We're going to try to image what's in there and see if there's something dense and small in the middle of a container that shouldn't have anything like that. Because as you're going to see in a few weeks, uh, the amount of material you need to make a nuclear weapon is about the size of my fist. Okay, that's all you need. Uh, and it's very high density, uh, very high Z. And so if you take an x-ray, there's a chance you might see it. And again, we're going to try to do all those things. And, oh, by the way, if there are questions, please interrupt. Okay, so if you go down to the port of Oakland right now, you actually see this. These are pictures we took there on a couple of our visits. Um, these are uh, some of the cranes that take the containers off the ships and put them onto either trucks or rail cars. Um, if they go onto a truck, every single truck that comes out of the port of Oakland goes through a device that looks like this. These are passive radiation detectors. Port of Oakland was one of the first places in the country where these were installed, and I think if not all the ports, most of them have it now, and they all will uh, in a short period of time. There are plastic scintillators like the ones we talked about last week here, and also neutron counters. And what happens is the truck drives through there, and these counters look for gamma rays and or neutrons above the normal background, which is present when the trucks aren't there. And they drive through at about two or three miles an hour, so the whole container takes maybe 10, 20 seconds to drive through. And if the number of counts that these detectors see is above some preset threshold, an alarm goes off and the truck gets stopped. Uh, on one of our visits, this flatbed truck came through with this enormous cask on it that was clearly labeled as being radioactive. Okay? And when it drove through a detector system like this, the alarms did go off. So that was kind of reassuring. And then these guys in their police uniforms came out to stop the truck and try to figure out if what was in this container was what it actually said it was. The labels on it said it was cobalt-60. It was a very large source of cobalt-60, something like 10,000 curies or so. And sources like that are typically used in hospitals for sterilizing medical equipment or for food irradiation. There are legitimate purposes for having such a large source. So these guys came out and they had a little handheld sodium iodide detector, which could measure not only the fact that there were gamma rays coming out of this thing, but measure the energy spectrum. And it had a little uh, algorithm inside it to try to identify the isotope based on the gamma rays it saw. And when they held their little devices up here, the device could not tell them that it was actually cobalt-60. Okay? Uh, okay, you guys are experts now on gamma rays. What might have been the problem? Cobalt-60, if you don't remember, emits two very nice gamma rays. 1173 and 1332 KeV. So why couldn't their sodium iodide tell that? Exactly, exactly. There are tons and tons of lead and steel here between the source and us to prevent the source from doing damage to us. So as you're suggesting, most of those gamma rays Compton scatter or do something in the steel and lead before they get out. And so the fraction of the gamma rays that emerge from that container with their original energy is very, very small. So what their spectra showed were sort of blurry spectra with no real distinctive peaks. 
Now there were a bunch of us nuclear scientists standing around and after a couple minutes we all figured out that must be the trouble and we told these guys, but of course they're not going to believe us. So they have a system in place to deal with this. They take their spectra, they send it via radio back to a laboratory where they have a trained nuclear scientist who looks at the spectrum and within 10 minutes the answer came back, yeah, it's cobalt-60, let it go. So it was actually pretty reassuring that for something like this at least it works. So in terms of uh, gamma ray sources that would be useful for dirty bombs, I think we're in pretty good shape. These kind of detectors can see them. On the other hand, yeah? Say again? Yeah, so there's an arch like this over every lane that trucks leave the port from. So every single cargo container that comes out of the port of Oakland goes through one of those. Only one. It only went through one. That one triggered. Oh, okay. Um, it could be, I don't remember exactly the location. It could be there was only one portal around this particular area. Uh, that is not the portal this guy went through. This is in a different location. They do have several of them. Um, and I don't know. It looks to me like there is another one right here next to that. So that could be the kind of crosstalk you're talking about. And when we were there, there were not so many uh, trucks going through that there would be a confusion as to which was the source. It's a good question. Though. Um, so that kind of thing is going on. And then if there's ever an issue as to whether the cargo seems to match what the manifest says it should be, uh, they have a radiography system in place. It's called VACUS. And what it is, there's a, a large source of cobalt-60. It's something like one Curie. Um, it's on an arm of this truck. There's a source in here inside a lead shield with a shutter on it. And over on the truck, there's an array of position-sensitive sodium iodide detectors. And what they can do is drive the truck down the length of the cargo container, open the shutter, and let the gamma rays go through the container. And then they measure the gamma rays on the other side. And they actually get an image of the cargo from how much attenuation there is as a function of distance along the truck. And they get very, very good resolution, something like a centimeter or so. A position resolution. And so when they scan the truck, if the manifest says it's supposed to be, you know, ladies' clothing, uh, that should be reasonably transparent to these gamma rays. And if they see a big dark object in the middle, they might get suspicious. And something like three or five percent of all the containers through the Port of Oakland get inspected this way, but the rest of them don't. Okay. And what we expect to do is to use all of these things plus new techniques to try to trip up the bad guys who are trying to smuggle this stuff in. Okay, so active interrogation is what we're going to try to do. We're going to shoot something in and look for a signal. And the question is, what signal do you look for? So one thought is gamma rays um, are a unique signature through lots of nuclear processes. And one way to produce gamma rays is via neutron capture. So one thought was you shoot neutrons in. And for example, if there's U-235 there, it could capture the neutrons. And I've shown you before that each capture process gives you a distinct spectrum of nuclear gamma rays. And so if you could detect those capture gamma rays, it would tell you whether or not you've got U-235 there. And in the laboratory, that works very, very well if all you have is U-235 sitting there. But we're looking for literally the needle in the haystack. We're looking for something like 10 kilograms or so. That's about the amount you need to make a bomb. Whereas the cargo container is not presumably empty, so there could be up to 10,000 kilograms of anything else. And all those other things will also capture neutrons and also produce gamma rays. So the signal that you're looking for, the gamma rays from the fissionable stuff, is going to be buried in a spectrum that has thousands of other gamma rays that are not of interest. And it, it turns out it's just impractical to try to do this on an object so big as a cargo container. So that won't work. What you want to make use of is the fact that the reason this stuff is dangerous is that it is fissionable. And although we haven't talked in detail yet about it, uh, back on day one, we talked about the general idea that you can take something like U-235 and add a neutron to it. And you now know that often what will happen is you'll make a compound nucleus, in this case U-236, which is very highly excited. And for nuclei like uranium and plutonium, once you make this compound nucleus, most often the way it decays is not by the process we, we've talked about so far. It undergoes nuclear fission, which means it splits apart into two very large fragments, roughly equal in mass, and a few extra neutrons. Okay? And so in this example, what is shown is just one of literally hundreds of different ways this fission can happen. 
Remember, all you have to do is conserve neutron and proton number, and there are lots of different ways you can do that. So here, the U-236 is split apart into krypton-90 and barium-143 and three extra neutrons. The point is that these nuclei that get made are very, very neutron-rich because the uranium isotopes are way on the neutron-rich side of N equals Z. So these isotopes are all radioactive. They beta minus decay. And most of them have fairly short half-lives. And so we want to actually exploit that as a way to detect the fissionable material. So you also know that most of the time when these radioactive isotopes decay, they decay to excited states in the daughter nuclei. And because the isotopes that get produced in the fission process are so neutron rich, the decay energies they have are very, very large. And so here's one example. This happens to be bromine 87. Uh, it has a half-life of just under a minute. And it decays to krypton 87. But a lot of the time, it will decay to states that are so high up in energy that those states will decay by emitting neutrons. This is called beta-delayed neutron emission, which we talked a little bit about. Or it will decay to excited states, which decay by gamma ray emission, but very high energy, 5 MeV, 4 MeV, 3 MeV gamma rays. There are very few other types of radioactive decays where you get such high energy gamma rays or beta-delayed neutrons. And so that's what we actually want to make use of in this screening technique to look for the fissionable material, is to look for very, very high energy gamma rays or beta-delayed neutrons, because these are going to be signatures of fission. Um, about seven years ago now, Professor Stan Prusin from this department and I were out at Lawrence Livermore Lab. We were both on sabbatical for a summer, and we happened to share an office. And we got put into a group that was looking at this problem. And after the first few weeks, they told us what they thought was the solution. They were going to look for these beta-delayed neutrons. They figured that was a unique signature because very few things emit beta-delayed neutrons. And Stan and I talked about it for a little bit. And after a couple weeks, we decided in most circumstances that wouldn't work. Not that the beta-delayed neutrons aren't there. It has to do with the fact that this is happening inside a cargo container. Um, and rather than just tell our Livermore hosts that their technique wouldn't work, we decided to try to come up with an alternative mechanism that would work. So we spent a few weeks, and what we did is we went through all the fission products that are known, and we looked up their decay properties, and we made tables that look like this. And this is a complicated table that has lots of numbers in it, but this has to do with the neutron-induced fission of U-235. These are some of the radioactive isotopes that get produced. These are their half-lives, and you don't have to stare at the numbers too much, but they, they range from seconds to a few minutes. And what the other two columns have to do with is the fraction of the time when each of these isotopes decay, you get a gamma ray above either 4 MeV or 3 MeV. <coughs> now you might say, well, how, why does he care about the energy of the gamma ray? Well, it turns out that the gamma rays have an easier time getting out of material the higher their energy is. Because all the cross sections for the Compton scattering, pair production, and uh, photoelectric effect go down as you go up in energy until you get to about 10 MeV and then they start coming up again. So if you're trying to get gamma rays out of the cargo container, high energy is better. And if you're trying to distinguish these gamma rays from normal background, the natural radioactive background stops at 2.6 MeV. Okay? So if you're looking at 3 or 4 MeV, there is no background to speak of. And if you see it, that's a clear signature you had fission. And furthermore, these half-lives are short, so you're looking for events above 3 or 4 MeV with a characteristic half-life, and it turns out that half-life ends up being about 20 seconds. So each of these numbers from each isotope are very, very small. But if you add them all up, so if you take this column and add all the numbers up, and ask yourself, given that a fission of U-235 happens, what's the chance I get a gamma ray emitted above 3 MeV? It's almost 13%. So 13% of the time you get a gamma ray above uh, 3 MeV emitted. That's a lot. That's a lot. And if you do the same thing for plutonium, it's not quite so good for reasons we'll see in a little bit. Uh, it's 6.5% of the time you get a gamma ray above 3 MeV emitted. And so based on this, we decided the gamma rays are a lot better to look at than the neutrons. And this illustrates it a little more. Because if you go back and ask, well, what is the fraction of the time you get a beta-delayed neutron? Uh, this is shown in this table over here. So beta-delayed neutrons from U-235 fission are uh, 0.01, okay, about 10 times smaller than the probability for getting beta-delayed gamma rays above 3 MeV, and also a factor of 10 smaller for plutonium. 
So the intensity of the neutrons while they're there are 10 times smaller than the intensity of the gamma rays above 3 MeV. And then furthermore, if you ask yourself, what is the chance these things will get out of a cargo container, it gets even more in favor of the beta delayed gamma rays. And this is shown over here. This is a fairly complicated plot. What it's showing you is the relative probability for something to escape, the flux if you like, as a function of how much material the radiation has to pass through. And in these calculations, there were two different kinds of cargo looked at. One was aluminum and the other was wood. We know there's a lot of wood in the cargo containers or food. And the reason that's important is that uh, the wood, the, the food, has a lot of hydrogen in it. And hydrogen captures neutrons quite well. You've seen that already. And so if you have hydrogenous cargo, cargo that has a lot of hydrogen in it, the neutrons are going to have a very hard time getting out. And that's what this plot is trying to show. So this blue curve is the relative number of 3 MeV gamma rays that would escape from the wood. And the black curve is the number of 300 keV neutrons that would escape from the wood. And this is a log plot. So if you're looking at, let's say, 50 grams per square centimeter material, uh, the neutrons are basically zero, and the gamma rays haven't been attenuated very much at all. So the gamma rays have a much easier time getting out of the hydrogenous cargo. If you go to things like aluminum, uh, the comparison is not quite so favorable, but still in most circumstances, the gamma rays do better than the neutrons. So from a combination of the fact that there are more of these gamma rays emitted and they're easier to escape from the cargo, we concluded beta delayed gamma rays were the way to go. And so at the end of our summer, we presented this to our Livermore colleagues, and we came up with a way you might actually do this. Uh, we said what you would do is you would irradiate the container with neutrons to stimulate or to force the fission to happen. So you would turn your neutron beam on for a while. The beam would be on for some period of time. And then you would turn it off. And while the beam is off, you would then look for these beta delayed gamma rays to be emitted. You wouldn't look while the beam was on because during that time, the neutron captures are occurring on everything. There'd be an enormous background. It'd be very hard to tell whether there was fissionable material or not. Whereas in here, there wouldn't be much of anything else. And we figured that you probably couldn't irradiate the whole container at once. So you might irradiate a portion of it here, count it, move the container, irradiate another portion, and repeat the process three or four times, and do the whole container in something like a minute. So our Livermore host said, gee, that's all very interesting, but you know, go back to Berkeley now, you academics. Uh, we're the professionals. We're going to do it our way. And so we came back to Berkeley, but rather than just forget about it, we decided to do some small-scale experiments to prove that the basic ideas were correct. And so we went up to Lawrence Berkeley Lab to the cyclotron you saw on Friday, and we used it to make neutrons, and we irradiated a whole bunch of different materials um, for something like 30 seconds. Then we would turn the beam off and look for the gamma rays that were emitted. And initially, we used very high energy resolution germanium detectors, like the one I brought into class a few days ago. And if you do this kind of thing on something like steel, a normal material that would be found in cargo containers, so you radiate a chunk of steel with neutrons, you turn the beam off and look, you see an, an energy spectrum. So this is the energy of the gamma rays. This is how many. Uh, you see a few isolated gamma rays at fairly low energies. And it turns out if you measure the half-lives of these gamma rays, they're very long. It turns out it's a few hours in this case. <coughs> and that's fairly typical for almost anything except visionable material. On the other hand, if you radiate plutonium the same way and count it, that's what you see. And what you probably have a hard time seeing in the back of the room is that there are literally hundreds of individual gamma rays there. There are lots of little lines here, each one of which comes from the decay of one particular fission fragment. And there are hundreds of fission fragments being made. So there are lots and lots of lines there. In a real port setting, it's impractical to use a germanium detector. They're too expensive. They're too fragile. There's no way you would do that. We would end up using a poor energy resolution detector, like the plastic scintillator I showed you. And you can sort of imagine what would happen if I had a spectrum that looked like this, and I had terribly bad energy resolution. I'm going to lose all the lines, but I'm still going to have that triangular shaped wedge. And notice it extends out a lot higher in energy than these gamma rays do. And furthermore, if you look at the region of gamma ray energy above 3 MeV, and just add up all the gamma rays above 3 MeV, and plot them as a function of time after you turned off your neutron beam, you get this plot shown up here. Okay, so this is now the number of gamma rays above 3 MeV versus time. 
it decays not quite exponentially, and the reason is that there isn't a single isotope there. There are lots and lots of different isotopes. But if you fit that upper curve, it turns out it's not a bad fit to something like a 25 second half-life. And so this triangular shaped wedge energy spectrum and that 25 second half-life is a unique signature of fission. There is nothing else that looks like that. And so if you see that, you know you've got fissionable material there. And so we published a couple papers based on that, and that convinced the Livermore folks that in fact these ideas were right. And so they built a very large lab to see whether you could do this on a large scale, not just little tiny things. So this lab um, was at Lawrence Livermore Lab. There's a photograph of it there. There's a cartoon that's explaining what's going on here. We wanted to produce neutrons that had fairly high energy so they could actually go into the container and penetrate through a lot of material. And the way that was done is there was an accelerator which was in the basement. So this is one floor and a floor below there was an accelerator <coughs> that would accelerate deuterium to four million electron volts. And the four MeV deuterons would collide with the deuterium gas target and through a reaction of D plus D going to helium three plus neutron, you would end up with neutrons that came up out of the floor with energies that range from about seven MeV down to two and a half MeV. And they would come up in a cone and above that, we would place our cargo. Uh, in the photograph up there, the accelerator, the neutron beam comes up uh, through a hole in the floor where that white tray is. And we would place our cargo, which in our case, we would use either stacks of wood or stacks of uh, steel pipes to mimic the cargo. And then inside the cargo, we could place our target of highly enriched uranium. And we could move it around in height to study the radiation we would see as a function of how much material the neutron beam had to penetrate before reaching the target. And the detectors we used are these big black slabs you see over here. They are plastic scintillators, and these are big ones. So these were two feet by two feet by uh, 10 inches thick, and they had a single photomultiplier tube on the back steering inwards, looking for the scintillation light when the gamma ray radiation hit it. We also had some bigger ones. These were two feet by four feet with phototubes on the end. And we built two walls that could stand on either side of the uh, cargo, and then we could put the, the radioactive material inside. And here's some more photographs. This is um, the wood cargo. What we did is we went to Home Depot and bought lots of one inch thick sheets of plywood, four by eight feet, and then we stacked them up to make a stack that's about six feet high. And there was a hole drilled in the plywood stack that allowed us to put the uranium at any elevation we wanted inside. And that's shown over here. And then similarly, these are steel pipes. It's a little hard to see, but there are pipes running this way and then pipes running this way. Um, and again, we could put the uranium anywhere inside the pipes. You might say, well, this isn't fair. You know, why am I using pipes? Why don't I use uh, solid sheets? But that goes back to the point that you can't just put a solid block of steel in these containers. That would overload it too. This was set up so it had the 0.7 grams per cubic centimeter density, just like you could have in the container. And there are very few places in the world where this kind of experiment can be done because you need large amounts of highly enriched uranium or plutonium. Livermore is one of these places. Uh, but even at a place like Livermore, people like me are not allowed to touch this stuff. So every time we wanted to use the material, we had to call Denny. He was one of the technicians who was actually authorized to handle the uranium. So here he is putting the uranium into the stack of plywood. And we would do our experiment. Then if we wanted to move it to some other location, we'd call him. He'd come back, move it for us. So it takes a lot of people to do these kind of things in very controlled environments. And what we're looking at in this case is a relatively large amount of uranium. It's about 400 grams. But again, that's a lot smaller than you actually need to make a weapon. So the tests we were doing were basically uh, proof of principles. Uh, if we could see this small amount, we could certainly see 10 kilograms much easier. So this is the same kind of spectrum I showed you a minute ago. This is what we saw with germanium detectors here in Berkeley. This is the steel spectrum. This is the um, plutonium spectrum. <coughs> and now when we did the experiment at Livermore with the large plastic scintillation detectors, as I said, you lose the energy resolution so you don't see these lines anymore. Uh, let's just look at the blue curve for a minute. So this is the number of counts you see. This is the energy. Um, the blue curve is what you see when you've got about 380 grams of uranium buried one foot into the wood. So you've irradiated it with neutrons, you've turned the beam off and looked. And the red curve is what you get if there's no uranium in the wood. 
So you can see that there's a big difference here. And the, the thing I'd point out is this is a log scale. So even though you may not think that's very big, that's more than a factor of 10 difference in the number of counts you see above 3 MeV when you've got the uranium there versus when you don't. And the other colors are when you're looking through 2 feet or 3 feet of wood. And I'll show you some more data in a minute. If you look at the region above 3 MeV and measure not just how many events you see, but how many as a function of time, uh, you end up with that blue set of data shown there. That's when the uranium is present in the container. Whereas if there's no uranium, you get the black set of data points. And again, there's a big increase in the number of counts. But furthermore, you see an exponential decay. And if you fit that, what you can explain that curve as being due to primarily is three fission fragments. Uh, rubidium-90, rubidium-91, and rubidium-92, whose half-lives are shown here. And so with those three components, we explain most of the events we see. And so not only do we understand how many there are, we understand exactly which isotopes are producing them. So we really do uh, have a good understanding of the fission process here, and that's what we're observing. So we decided to explore the sensitivity in detail. So again, here's the wood pile. Uh, what we're doing is adjusting the height of the uranium inside the wood. So we're moving it up further and further away from the neutron source. So the neutrons get scattered and attenuated by going through more and more wood. And we're looking at the gamma rays over here in our plastic scintillators. <coughs> These are all done with uh, 30 seconds of irradiation and then we count. And this is when you're looking through one foot of wood, two feet, three feet, four feet. We can see it through up to five feet of wood. Okay, and for neutrons, Wood is the worst kind of material you can have because the neutrons uh, get absorbed by the hydrogen. And if you ask yourself, okay, could I do this in a minute? The answer is clearly yes. You could do the whole thing in a minute. If you have the steel cargo, things are not quite as good for the gamma rays because the steel, while it doesn't absorb the neutrons as much as the wood does, it does absorb the gamma rays. It's a higher Z material. The cross sections for the uh, Compton scattering and so on are higher. And so the gamma rays have a harder time getting through. And so we actually also, in addition to looking for the gamma rays in the plastic scintillators, we put neutron counters on top. So we could also see the beta delayed neutrons. And in fact, you would want to do both in a real scanning situation because you don't necessarily know exactly what's in the container. So this came to be real. We decided this would actually work. And we decided to try to build a system that could scan the whole cargo container in one minute and demonstrate this. And the drawing which is shown here was an artist's conception of what it might look like. And this became known as the nuclear car wash because it kind of looks like that. Uh, so the idea was, here's your container. You would put it on a flatbed truck or a trolley or something would let you move it. You would have a neutron source. In this drawing, it's shown coming up out of the floor like we had in our lab. Uh, if you go to the ports, the people who run the ports will tell you absolutely no way we would ever let you do that. And the reason is that real estate at the ports is incredibly valuable, and they want to move things around on a moment's notice. So we couldn't ever have a permanent installation like that, but we figured out a way around that anyway. But for the purposes here, let's just imagine you had the neutrons coming up like that. You drag the front part of the container over it. You irradiate for maybe five seconds. You turn the beam off, and then here are your plastic scintillator arrays sitting on either side looking for the gamma rays. You don't irradiate the whole container at once. So you move it a little further, you irradiate the next section, repeat it. And in three or four repeats of irradiation count, irradiation count, you could scan the whole container and you could do it all in a minute. So we got to this point. We proposed this to the Department of Homeland Security. And Homeland Security was looking at a whole bunch of different technologies at this point. Uh, so we solicited a proposal. And unfortunately, DHS's budget got cut right at this time. And rather than being able to fund five projects, they funded two. And ours was not selected. Okay. We were convinced at Livermore that this would actually work. And Professor Proustin and I uh, submitted patent applications to the US Patent Department. We got five patents on this. So the technology is there. And in principle, it could be done. Um, and so hopefully, somebody will pick this up. There are other competing technologies that are being worked on right now. And if you think about what I've told you today, I think you'll figure out ways you could get around this and smuggle that nasty stuff in. Um, and that's true for all of the technologies that are being looked at. And so the idea is not to do just one. You would do several of these things. And um, hopefully, something like this will be implemented in the near future. There's nothing like that out there right now anywhere in the world. Um,
but hopefully in the future there will be. So I will stop now. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Very good. So that, that's one of the questions people have to think about. Uh, in any of these technologies, you're talking about a radiating container with radiation. In our case, it's neutrons. And if you go to the ports and talk to the people who run them, they will tell you that about one time a month, they open up a container and people walk out of it. Okay, people get smuggled in these containers. And it turns out there are limits as to how much radiation we are allowed to deliver to those people. Uh, with the neutrons, it's true, it's true. Uh, with the neutrons, we, we were concerned about this issue and we figured out that the dose you would end up giving them is something like 100 millirem, which is a measurable dose, but it's not gonna hurt or kill anybody. On the other hand, there are other technologies which wanna shoot high energy gamma rays in instead of neutrons. And one scheme is you basically look for the same signal I was talking about, but rather than using neutrons to induce the fission, you use high energy gamma rays. Because as we'll see in a few days, if you have gamma rays of about six MeV, you can induce fission in uranium and plutonium. The trouble is the probability for those gamma rays to produce fission is about 100 times smaller than it is for neutrons to do it. And so the radiation dose you would give people is much, much higher with the gamma rays. I'm not saying you would kill them, but you would do some serious damage with gamma rays. So that is one of the concerns. A related concern is what about all the other stuff in the container which isn't fissionable? Okay? All that food, all the, the metals, the vehicles, electronics, whatever. The neutrons are going to get captured on those things and we will make them slightly radioactive. Again, we were concerned about that and we looked quite carefully at what radioactive isotopes we would make and almost all of them have very short half-lives and so they would decay away before the cargo ever got delivered to the final destination. But nevertheless, there would be a tiny bit of residual radioactivity. And if you were ever gonna try to do this on a large scale, we figured there would have to be a very large education campaign to convince the public that this little tiny bit of additional risk was worth the benefit of not having nuclear weapons in their cargo. But there is a risk-benefit analysis you have to do. Other questions? Yeah. I'm sorry, say that again? You bet, you bet. So that, uh, right, of course. So, you know, you look at that picture of the Port of Oakland, you might think, well, why not just detonate the bomb as soon as it comes under the Golden Gate Bridge, right? So ideally, you would like to do this kind of scanning not here. You'd like to do it in the foreign port before that cargo gets put on the ship. That's an enormous problem. That's a political problem we'd have to solve with our trading partners to see if they would let us do that, yeah. Right, exactly. So that's another technique, nuclear resonance fluorescence, that we and other folks around the world are looking at. Uh, this is where you shine nuclear gamma rays on the container, and if the gamma rays match the energy of a particular excited state in the target nucleus, it gets resonantly absorbed, and you can detect that. Um, that would also work in certain circumstances. If you have a lot of lead, that's not going to work so well, but uh, yes, that's another technology that's being developed. It turns out First of all, you have to know the energy of the gamma rays you're looking for, and for a lot of these isotopes, it actually isn't known yet. There was another question back here. So that's another good question. Um, we're gonna make a little tiny bit of fission, not enough to cause an explosion. But if you were you know, interested in using that, you, know, you might say, okay, I know these guys are gonna be shooting neutrons in. I'll put a little neutron detector next to the bomb, and as soon as the neutron detector sees something, I detonate the bomb. Yeah, there are ways around all these things. Yeah. yeah. Um, it turns out that's classified. <laughs> We did, and I can't tell you the answer, yeah, yeah. right. But what I was trying to show you is that we were testing things with much less material than you need to make a bomb. So it's very sensitive, very sensitive. Other questions? Okay, so that's not on the exam, but I thought it was a nice application of some of the things we talked about. Um, office hours today, no class Wednesday, exam Friday. Okay. okay.